Hello, my name's Stuart. I'm the curator of the Cromwell Museum in Huntingdon. It's a great pleasure to be back with you again for another one of our Cromwellian conversations, the first one of 2023, and this time tying in with our current exhibition, which is on the leveller movement of the 17th century. So today there is much made of by politicians at the moment in the UK of a levelling up agenda, where funding should be targeted towards parts of the country that have been left behind in terms of investment in recent years. Three centuries ago though, being a leveller had a very different connotation. The levellers were a loose political movement that developed during the 1640s, in the wake of the brutal civil wars that tore apart not only England, but Wales, Scotland and Ireland. In November 1647, representatives of this movement some civilians, but many more from Parliament's victorious army, met senior officers at Mary's Church in Putney to discuss what sort of government the country should have after this English Revolution. Some of them proposed radical notions for the 1600s, including, for the first time, the idea that all men should have the vote. Now, for the 375th anniversary of this meeting, and at a time when the nature of democracy seems more topical than ever given recent UK politics, the Cromwell Museum in Huntingdon has got a display which runs until the beginning of April that looks at the leveller movement and this remarkable meeting that took place in Putney. So how can we define the levellers? Well, they're broadly a group of people who wanted legal reform, religious toleration, more men to be able to vote, and a government that seemed more answerable to the people. Leading radical thinkers like John Lilburn and William Walwyn inspired the movement, spreading their ideas through printed pamphlets. The actual name leveller was used as an insult by their enemies, implying that they wanted to abolish property rights and re redistribute wealth, something which the levellers themselves strenuously denied. Those ideas were adopted by other radicals, people like Gerard Wynne Stanley, who led a group of families who became known as diggers, occupying common land and setting up communities with a common ownership of property. These radical political ideas were able to spread, particularly in the political hotbed that was London at this time, but also beyond the capital thanks to the increase of use of new technology, the printing press, the internet revolution of its time. Now, before the Civil War, there had been strict government regulation and censorship of all printed materials. At a time when perhaps a third of the population was literate, so if you couldn't read and write yourself, you knew someone else who could. Once war broke out, control disappeared and huge quantities of print was produced, and both sides used printing as a means of spreading propaganda. Printed texts could also be used to discuss, debate and spread radical political ideas in a way that had never been available before in Britain, and the levellers were particularly effective in doing this. Now, much of the civil war between King Charles I and Parliament had been a stalemate, with neither side really gaining an advantage. Military reforms championed in Parliament by an obscure Huntingdonshire MP turned soldier called Oliver Cromwell, and more about him later, had led to the creation of a new properly equipped and organised fighting force in 1645, which by historians called the New Model Army. And commanded by Sir Thomas Fairfax with Cromwell as his deputy, this force changed how Parliament's fortunes with a decisive victory at the Battle of Naseby in Northamptonshire in June 1645. A year later, Charles I was forced to surrender, being placed under house arrest whilst negotiations were carried out with him to come to a long-term political settlement. With the fighting over in 1647, Parliament's soldiers were owed arrears of pay, and they also wanted indemnity for their wartime actions. They feared the army would be disbanded first, or that they would be forced to serve in Ireland, where fighting continued, far away from their families. Inspired by leveller pamphlets, some of the soldiers went further, demanding political reform. A lot of them felt, as they'd fought and bled for their country, they should have a say in its future government. And in the summer of 1647, an army council was formed of senior officers, including Sir Thomas Fairfax and Oliver Cromwell, and elected representatives or agitators of ordinary soldiers from each regiment. Now, many agitators worked with Lilburn and the civilian levellers to produce a manifesto in October 1647, the iconic agreement of the people. Here they demanded male suffrage, religious toleration and a fair legal system. The soldiers also issued their own pamphlet, The Case of the Army Truly Stated, which reinforced these radical ideas, as well as criticising negotiations between the generals and King Charles I to find a compromised political solution. 
To try and resolve the situation, it was agreed that the senior officers, or grandees, should meet the agitators to discuss their proposals. And this meeting was held at St Mary's Church in Putney in London at the end of October 1647. At the Putney debates, Fairfax was ill, so the meeting was chaired by Oliver Cromwell, with the case for the grandees being set by his son-in-law, Henry Ireton. The senior leveller was Colonel Thomas Rainsborough. And the majority of the debates were over who should have the right to vote. Rainsborough argued that all men were entitled to vote. Ireton said that this would lead to anarchy, and that voting should be restricted to property owners as it was at the time. After much debate, a compromise was reached, so that the vote would be extended to include all men who had fought for Parliament, but royalists, beggars and servants should also be excluded. At no point, by the way, there was any suggestion that the women should be allowed the vote. Rainsborough's words on the subject are famous. The poorest he that hath in England hath a life to live as the greatest he. I think it's clear that every man that is to live under a government ought first by his own consent to put himself under that government. And I do think that the poorest man in England is not at all bound in a strict sense to that government that he hath not had a voice to put himself under. Now this compromise, reached by both sides, would be put to the army for approval at assemblies of some of their regiments. However, alarmed by news of the debates, and fearing that he might be assassinated, King Charles I escaped house arrest, and immediately the prospect of war put an end to the output of the debates, the generals deciding at this point that the needs of army discipline and the threat of war overrode any of the levellers' radical ideas. A gathering of troops that did take place on the 15th of November at Courtbush Field led to a small mutiny by some of the soldiers, which was quashed by Fairfax and Cromwell. One of their ringleaders was executed as a warning to his fellows. Although King Charles I was rapidly recaptured, civil war broke out again. This meant that the levellers kept a lower profile within the army, but their influence grew amongst the population of London. A petition to Parliament in September 1648 was signed by no less than a third of the population of the capital, and when their hero Thomas Rainsborough was killed by royalist agents, his funeral in London attracted many thousands of mourners. In January 1649, Charles I was put on trial and executed. England now became a commonwealth, a republic run by Parliament. Almost immediately, leveller leaders clashed with the new regime, Lilburn and others were imprisoned in 1649 for publishing a pamphlet, England's New Chains Discovered, criticising Parliament for seizing power from the people. Now, at a time when it was taken for granted in a very male-dominated society that women should have no formal role in politics, there still was no suggestion by the levellers that the vote should be extended to them. That doesn't mean that women did not play a part in the leveller movement including Mary Overton, Elizabeth Lilburn, and most particularly Catherine Chidley, a lay preacher, campaigner and pamphleteer. In April 1649, Chidley and hundreds of other women gathered at Parliament, demanding the release of John Lilburn and the other leveller leaders. Fearing being sent to Ireland as Parliament's army under Cromwell, some soldiers mutinied in the spring of 1649, most famously in May at Burford in Oxfordshire. Several hundred leveller mutineers were captured when Cromwell stormed the town. Three of the ringleaders were tried and executed by firing squad. After this, the leveller movement gradually declined. Lilburn was imprisoned in 1653, Wildman in 1655, while some levellers led by Edward Sexby became involved with failed conspiracies to overthrow Cromwell once he became Lord Protector. You can discover more about the remarkable story of the Leveller movement in our temporary display at the Cromwell Museum, which runs until the beginning of April 2023. The exhibit includes surviving examples of the radical pamphlets produced by the Levellers to circulate their ideas and portraits of some of those involved. The exhibit is free of charge to visit during our normal opening hours, and we do hope you'll take the opportunity to come and have a look. We also have a dramatic reconstruction of the Putney debates taking place the last weekend in February, the 25th and 26th. Tickets are available for this again from the Cromwell Museum's website. I hope you found that interesting. If you do, please remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
Uh, please also do have a look at our other videos on here. Do follow us on social media as well. We are an independent charity, so if you feel able to do so, all donations are particularly gratefully received. Otherwise, we hope to see you again very soon for another one of our videos, and thank you very much for joining us today.